It's who you meet that makes a difference. Welcome to Island Influencers, where we share stories of successful business owners, experienced professionals, entrepreneurs and community leaders based or with influence in the Isle of Man. This podcast is brought to you by Thornton Chartered Financial Planners, because great financial planning has the power to change your life. Now here's your host, Chartered Financial Planner, Sharon Sutton. Welcome to this week's Island Influencers. And my guest this week is Sue Cook, who is the Chief Executive of Junior Achievement. JA, as it's known, is a Manx registered to charity, helping the island's young people gain the essential skills they need when they leave full-time education. Sue has lived and worked in the Isle of Man since 1997, holding senior posts on the island and in the UK. She's previously worked for more than 20 years in the recruitment industry. Sue joined the Junior Achievement team in October 2009, and she's a fellow of the Chartered Institute of Personnel and Development. Anyone who's met Sue will know that she's very passionate about helping young people get their first steps on the career ladder. And with her wealth of experience in the local job market, she provides an essential link between education and employment. Sue has experienced firsthand how the work of junior achievement can help transform lives and believes that it's who you meet that can make a difference. I was thrilled to meet Sue in this week's conversation in episode 47 of Island Influences. Welcome, Sue Cook, to Island Influences. I'm so pleased to finally meet you and get you on Island Influences podcast. Thanks so much for coming along. Thank you for inviting me. Oh, gosh, no, it's my pleasure. The junior achievement, um, I've been a big fan of it for, for many years, and it's, it's great to finally meet you. I wonder if you'd mind telling us, Sue, your story and how you came to be where you are now. So where, where did you grow up? I'm actually, I was born in Southport. Right. Uh, in the north of England. So um, I love being by the sea, although I've got to say I'm not a very good swimmer, <laughs> which is ironic. But you know, I was born in Southport. So right. very strong connections to the Isle of Man because it was definitely the holiday de- destination for my grandparents, my great grandparents and my parents, because they would just get on the boat at Liverpool and, and come across probably until the 70s, obviously, when you start to get the cheap holidays. And then yeah. I came for a couple of holidays as a child as well. So you went for a cruise first, yeah. you know? <laughs> steam packet cruise and then holiday holiday in the Isle of Man. What do you remember about that? I just remember being really excited going on a boat more than anything yeah. else, you know, because I'd never been on, on a boat. Um, and luckily, I think I must have had a good sailing, but I just remember being very, very busy at the time, hmm. you know, and lots of tourists about, but just being, just having really, really good memories as a child of, of visiting yeah. the Isle of Man. And then I left Southport at the age of eight. My father, or my stepfather was in service. He was a chauffeur. Right. He actually was the chauffeur for the gentleman who owned Red Rum before ah, he sold it. So right. that was a big thing in my family. But we moved to Sale in Cheshire where I was educated and, and right. grew up and left school with basic qualifications. And then my family moved to Warrington, which is where we ended up. And then I moved from Warrington to the Isle of Man yeah. uh, in the late 90s. So you left school at... 16 yes yeah and then you went to work for uh, well I went to work actually initially um when I was at school there there was definitely a two-tier system so there was grammar school and there was secondary school and if you were in secondary school you were really expected to be the fodder for shops and for uh, manufacturing really that was what was you were supposed to do okay did you realize that at the time I probably did. I had been very, I'd been influenced by the police who'd come into the school right. to give a talk. And I desperately wanted to be a policewoman, but I was, I'm just under five foot four. And at the time there was a height, I think it was five foot six, right. whereas the height difference has been taken away now in the police. So I couldn't join the police. Um, I actually got into college, two different colleges. Yeah but didn't have the money to be able to further my education. Right. So got a job in retail and I worked for this incredible man who was um, a German confectioner. He was literally a master at his craft. Some of the cakes he made were quite incredible. Wow. Loved it, but I was never going to get anywhere and then got a job with Greg's Bakery. Um, and that was 18 and by 19, I was assistant manager uh-huh. in Warrington in their biggest store managing 30 uh, odd people older than myself. It was a real right. baptism of fire. Yeah, how did you, how did you find that? A, a challenge, but loved it. <laughs> but, you know, Greg's Bakery. If you look back at their business model, yeah. Uh, even then, I was just amazed at how how good they are as a company, and you think how long they've lasted. Yeah. We used to have maps on the wall on how to make sandwiches and how much ingredients to put in your tomato, your cucumber. So they got their 
money right down to the last penny. You yeah. know, they really knew how to run a business. Yeah, and, and their process and, yeah, my word. It's an interesting way to learn a business, isn't it? Yeah, right. And, and I, um, it was at that point, really, that I started to look after the Saturday staff that had come in and the summer staff. Yeah. And it really felt to me to manage them and to develop them within the retail business. And then... Um, I moved to would be called probably home base now, which is a big DIY store yeah. and was a stock controller. But at that time we didn't have computerized stock control. So you can imagine a massive <laughs> DIY store yes. and being responsible for all the stock within that and ordering that. Absolutely loved that job. And then, well, how did you do it? Well, it was with, with pen and paper. I would actually have to go and count, physically count the stock. Yeah. So I really understand how to put a kitchen together and a bathroom together. I understand about wallpaper and all of those things. So I'd go down. Um, sometimes you'd have representatives that would come in that would count the stock, you know, from, say, Crown or Dulux. But most of the time I'd be on the shop floor trying to work out what we'd sold and then what I'd need to order for the coming weeks. But it's, it, again, you know, a really interesting exercise. And, of course, computers come in now. You've got point of sale on your tills. You can do it yeah. really easy. Yeah. There was none of that when I was working yeah, at the it's amazing. Real baptism of fire, as you said. And then finally on to mother care. Worked there until I had my son in 1989. At the time, my husband had made redundant. as I, I just had a new baby. So eight weeks old, I'm out yeah. trying to find a job. right. A real challenge then, um, because I'd go for a job and they would say to me, well, you've too much experience, so you can't just have a, an ordinary job. And you've got an eight-week-old baby, so you can't be a manager because you'll never cope with it. And so we opened up our own small business, a small cafe for two years and sold that as a, a going concern after a couple of years. And that was when a, a wonderful opportunity arose to go into youth training, which is where young people who left school without any qualifications. The idea was to try and find the work placement and to get them a national vocational qualification. Right. And I was working with 16 to 18-year-old young men who'd left school with really no hope. And I would go and find them placements where the government would subsidise that placement. And then they would come one day a week into the training centre with me and I would help them get a national vocational qualification. And I absolutely loved it. Um, I did that for two years. So yeah. when I finished youth training, I went into the recruitment industry, uh, which was a natural progression. Cause yes. Of, um, helping people that were skilled as opposed to unskilled. And during that time, I'd come on holiday to the Isle of Man uh, with my family and completely fell in love with it. But I also um, used to attend the World Morris Dancing Championships in the Isle of Man. Um, and for those people who don't know, it's not the Morris Dancing with the hanky and bells. It's very much formation teams, very much like cheerleading. It was very, very big in the Isle of Man in the 80s. And a lot yeah. of people I've spoken to still remember all the teams going up and down the prom and Morris Dancing. And uh, it just, I just fell in love with the island. And so when I had my own son, I used to bring him here for holidays yeah. and I just wanted to come and live here. It was just a, a big passion of mine. And I went to meet with Frank Newton at Hamlin Recruitment because that was the industry that I was working in at yeah, the time. Yeah. Yeah. And he explained to me it was quite hard to get a work permit in the Isle of Man. And I'd started on a three-year qualification at college uh, which I'd funded myself to get the Chartered Institute of Personnel and Development Qualification. And he said if I could finish that, the chances of me getting a job were far higher than if I didn't complete it. So, right, OK. So a further two years I studied. Right, um, where did you go to do that? At St. Helens College. Yeah. Um, but it was self-funded. It was really hard because I was yeah. holding a full-time job down with a young child and uh, So doing night school, basically. Yeah. yeah. And I completed that qualification in 97, wow. sold my house, moved to the Isle of Man. And at the time, there wasn't a job in the recruitment industry or a recruitment agency that I wanted to work for. And uh, I took a role as a sales administration manager for an optics company for 12 months. And then suddenly got a call out of the blue from a lady called Julia Callow, who was working for Frank Newton, to say, we've got a possible vacancy, come and have a chat to us. Yes. So initially I went on a temporary basis and then... It just was it just carried on from there and eventually was operations manager but at the time frank was very much involved with the business and i felt i was growing and probably outgrowing hamlin yeah and he felt there wasn't room for me to be promoted and so i left hamlin and opened up my own consultancy firm for a short period okay what was that called uh, it was called cook consultancy and i was doing uh, training and development uh, work permits recruitment all things hr related really yeah. And then suddenly, a year after leaving Hamlin, I got a call out the blue from Frank to say, look, I'd like you to come back. Um, I'm going to 
step aside from the business. I've got my boat. I want to go sailing. Um, and I'd like to make you uh, director of operations. So will you come back? And so I went back to Hamlin uh, yeah. for two years. But probably you'll be aware of this more than most. The financial crash that happened in 2008, 2009 had a significant impact on the recruitment industry. Yes. No longer were the permanent jobs that we were used to. Um, we'd had a, a exponential growth in the Isle of Man. You know, we had too many um, jobs, not enough people, and sometimes put into roles they perhaps weren't suited to. But suddenly everything changed overnight, and that had a massive impact on the recruitment industry. And for me, um, it just stopped being what I wanted it to be, which is very much about the client and the individual. A lot of smaller agencies had opened up and it was more about uh, reducing the fee than actually offering a proper service. And for me, it had, I'd lost the passion of working in the recruitment industry. Right, okay. And um, and I'd been doing some voluntary work, but then the opportunity arose at Junior Achievement. So yeah. uh, they advertised the role for chief executive. And it, for me... It was everything that I'd done <laughs> it's meant to previously. Be. Yeah. 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 You know, it took me a long time to find the right job, but that that was yeah. twelve years ago, two thousand and nine. That's, so. that's excellent. It, it really is. And and I mean junior achievement hasn't been around for that long and it's it's it was before that um you you were saying before. Um, it was it was young enterprise, young enterprise, which I remember being at school when yeah. when I was there. You know, so that's four, nearly forty years yeah, ago. It's so. the same organisation. Yeah. Um, many people may not know that it's over a hundred years old. The organisation itself. It started in the states yeah. with an industrialist who saw the benefit of taking the real world into the classroom. Uh, now operating right across the world, probably working with about 10 million young people a year. Gosh. Uh, we were a branch of Young Enterprise in the UK, and my understanding is. Uh, early 2000s we decided to register as junior achievement which is a brand that's known worldwide and become independent of the uk branch so that we could retain our funds on the island yeah for the benefit of the young people here because so important yeah rather than sending the money to the uk and mm. getting a proportion of that back uh, but that had all happened before i joined but when i joined in 2009 we were in a real state of flux uh, we hadn't got enough volunteers. We hadn't got enough money. Uh, we weren't able to get into enough schools. It was a, it was a real challenge, and it wasn't anyone's fault in particular. It's just that it had grown, and, and the charity just wasn't equipped yeah. to deal with that. Yeah, it's a. It seems to be a common story amongst charities. They grow to a certain size, and if you don't get you know the support, then they're going to suffer for it. But it sounds like they've got the right person in you because it's just gone from strength to strength. The first year was about putting foundations in. That was yeah. the challenge really, and getting the name Junior Achievement known because everybody I met knew it as Young Enterprise mm. and really building the relationships back up with the school but the single, single biggest challenge was getting the volunteers. Yeah so how did you go about that? Well I'm very fortunate that um, a lady called Joy Spence who joined me from Hamlin 12 months after into the role we got a lot of connections uh, because of the industry that we'd worked in so we started yeah. to leverage those connections. I think it became a point where if you see me in the street you probably walk to the opposite side of the road because you know I was going to ask you to <laughs> to come along and, and, and volunteer because we're both incredibly passionate about what we do. Um, yeah. Joy's been a youth worker for more than 30 years and so um, we were both completely on the same page and, and we knew that if we could make the volunteering experience a positive experience that you were more likely to come back and spread the word. Whereas if you went into a school and felt unsupported in a classroom with 30, 14 year olds, it could be an extremely stressful experience. <laughs> yeah, I'll say. Um, <laughs> but not if it's managed correctly. Yeah, yes. um, and so for the first year, I didn't know I was going to sleep at night. I didn't know I was going to find the funding from, find the money from, um, find the volunteers from. But, but I like a challenge. And so but it's taken a long, long time. It's definitely not been an overnight success. And we still... You know, moving forward now after COVID, we still have a lot, a lot of challenges to face. Um, our funding, we do get some funding from the Department of Education, and that's under review. You know, so we, what the future will hold, we really don't know. Gosh, yeah. I and mean, when you, you mentioned COVID before, and people uh, being on the Isle of Man and staying here, like last summer and this summer, long summer holidays, what's been the sort of latest challenge that you've tried to meet there? Well, I think what we've tried to do is, keep, even though we're not able to go in schools, is how do we continue with our work to support young people? So we've done a combination of things. Uh, we run the world's top entrepreneurial programme for young people, uh, known as the Company Programme, which is the one that people most know us for. And the students were taking part in this programme and have now had two lockdowns during this time. 
And so we've been working with them over Zoom um, to try and keep them motivated. And their mentors, their volunteer mentors have been incredible at the weekly meetings. And uh, we've been doing things like how to do a killer presentation and all all those kinds of things. And and we've even done a donut run in school this week just to go and say hello to them and and touch base with them. Because if ever they need that programme, they need it right now. And my team this week, we've been looking at all our school calendar thinking how can we schedule every programme in that we've missed over the two lockdowns to try and reach as many primaries and secondaries as we can so but um also what we're doing for the first time ever is we're doing summer classes uh, thanks to the help of zurich international so we've decided uh to launch these summer workshops for young people age specific and we're going to set them a business challenge to try and resolve and present to a group of judges uh, with the team winning a prize so we can, we want to make it fun but the feedback we're getting from parents is that children have probably had enough of being on zoom or being online and what they're missing um is that face-to-face interaction with people so i'm really quite looking forward to that yeah uh, i can i can imagine what, what what do you need to make this successful do you need more volunteers do you do you need more kids to come along what, what what do you need well a combination of things really i mean um junior achievement in general we we have been hard hit with volunteers because right. what's happened is people who traditionally volunteer for us um some people have changed jobs others their employers can't let them out we've also got a group of people that have been working from home that are a bit loath to come out of the safe working environment of home But if ever we needed to provide children with career support, it has to be now. You know, we really need to prepare them for the world of work. So we do need volunteers. But as far as the summer workshops are concerned... We've had um, nearly 100 children register already for the workshops. Gosh, already. Wow. It's only announced this week, wasn't yeah, it? But we are, yeah, but we've got more places available. I know okay. that some parents are unsure if they're going to go off island because of the borders now opening. Um, I think the workshops are run be- between the 3rd and the 12th of August. Yeah. So, you know, we're still welcoming registrations. And the programmes will be from 11 to 16 and um, completely free of charge thanks to Zurich providing lunch and they'll spend the whole day with us so yeah. we're going to do a workshop for for like 11 to 12 13 to 14 15 to 16 yeah so keep the sort of age groups yeah, so that, separate yeah. and they feel comfortable working with each yeah. other and where's it going to be at uh, the promenade suite in the villa marina oh right nice well we thought it'd be a nice a nice venue um it's self-contained from a safety perspective mm-hmm. but you can also open the windows if it, get, yeah. it gets really warm in there but we want to give the students the feel that it's a business environment we thought about running it in schools but i think the last thing you want to do when you just finish school is go back to school on the holidays quite right yes i think i think we could all uh, identify with that statement from having been at school once yes (laughs) ourselves yes what makes an ideal volunteer what are you what what sort of attributes are you looking for well we run different programs at different age groups yeah um we need a range of life skills so primary school is probably the easiest one to start with because we actually employ staff to go in primary and you work alongside them. In secondary, you will actually run the class, but you'll have another volunteer who works alongside you. So there'll be two of you running the class and the teacher manages the classroom behaviour. Invariably, we try and put you in with an experienced volunteer, but it's not always possible. Right. And depending on which programme, you'll probably find a programme that suits you best. So one of them we do is on money management. Uh, There was nothing on the curriculum. Um, After 2008, we had the financial crash. There was nothing on the curriculum for financial literacy. Amazing. So in (laughs) 2000, uh, when I joined JA, it was, for me, was really important. And I approached the Manx Lottery and got the funding to write the first financial literacy program in the junior achievement network and we've continued with that ever since so anyone who's got a good understanding of how to manage your money and not get into debt from banking to understanding identity theft to budgeting all those areas we cover and it's day-to-day stuff but we tend to find people that maybe work in the finance sector and more suited to that program uh, we have another program that t- teaches you how to get a job. So we pick apart the recruitment and selection process used by employers. So anyone who's used to recruiting staff, um, we do a lot. We do an entrepreneurial program. There's all different types of programs. Usually, you would find that your life skills would fit one of those programs. Yeah, yeah. And, and what sort of time commitment do you? Re- need for something like that entirely up to you so one program is half a day some programs are a day you can do one program a year you can do five programs a year we ask to meet you face to face for coffee so that we can show you what we do and do some vetting as well get some forms filled in and then um, we'll send you a program calendar out three months in advance so you can choose which school which program you do 
And then we ask you to meet up with the person you're going to be working with so you can decide who's going to deliver what. But we provide full training as well. Yeah. So, uh, for example, for a half-day programme, you're probably committing to a day because you've got to have your training and you're meeting with the other volunteer. Yeah. And if you've run that programme previously, then the time commitment next time is not as much the second time round. Yeah. yeah. But some volunteers will do a day, some will do 10 days a year. It, It really doesn't matter. You know, it's down to the individual. Have you got any favourite stories you could share from from volunteers and what they've what they've done or what they've told you about? Um, we've well, I, I think one of the one of my, going back to money management. One of my favourite stories is it was actually we delivered the program, the money management program, and the the young man in question, in the class had taken the book home to show his father, but his father was one of our volunteers. He hadn't realised that, and he was showing them. We showed them a bank balance challenge, and it's where this young lady had overspent because she desperately wanted to buy a leather jacket. <laughs> And um, she actually got into arrears and then uh, incurred charges from her bank. And he's showing his father this booklet and he's saying, can you believe this? He said, can you believe that this lady would go and buy that leather jacket and go overdrawn? He said, I think you should go and talk to your mother about that. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, uh-huh. And we've, had, we do, we've done other things as well. I mean, yeah, I've, I've been in sure. a class where you've had, um, we get them to line up because we're trying to show them about identity theft. And we got them to line up in their order of date of birth yeah. and order of the mother's maiden name. And they gave us that information really, really easily. And then afterwards, after the break, we were able to show them how easy it is for people who scam you to get information out of you. So, yes. you know, um, yeah, it, you, the classes are very mixed. We, we don't work on academic ability at junior achievement. We work, so when the groups are together, they're usually tutor groups, they're not academic groups. So our programmes are written, so regardless of your social or academic background, you, you take part. And it's very much learning by doing. So we yeah. don't stand in front of the class and start preaching to them. All the programmes have lots of really you know, fun games. Yeah, I've seen some of the material and that was a a number of years ago and it it looked incredible back then. Do you work with any, in conjunction with any other organisations, you you have sponsors, do you have any connections to like professional bodies, trade associations, stuff like that? Yeah, we have, um, we've got a network of connections who support us and usually they'll help us with with volunteers predominantly. But if we're looking at all our programmes, majority of our programmes have been written for uh, the Manx community so uh, right. yeah we do take some programs from Europe and from worldwide but they're not always specific for what we're yeah. looking for so if we're writing content for a program invariably we'll go out and do our research or we'll reach out to organizations that can give us some of that additional information to go in those programs so sure. we do that quite a lot you know seat feedback we've just got incredible support we've got a database of 300 volunteers that are supporting junior achievement it's wonderful but it's never enough because you never know if they're going to be available no of course and they're all all have busy lives yeah and and we're supporting on average about five thousand young people a year in the community so would you like to support more there's lots I'd like to do. <laughs> yeah, okay. you know, um, there's there's so much workshops that have been great. Uh, it's something that I've wanted to do for a while, um, being able to do those. But you, the the risk is as, as a charity is that you overstretch yourself. And then you and when I over promise under deliver. Absolutely. When I first joined Junior Achievement, um, that's what I did, and then he put myself into the ground trying to do that. <sighs> Gosh. <laughs> and we had a long talk about it at the board, and we had a strategic review. And there's a very interesting piece of research that shows that if a young person can have five contacts with an employer whilst they're in education that's a meaningful contact with them maybe a day doing a program they are five times less likely to be unemployed when they leave education and on average will learn about 15 percent more than their peers and that's because it's who you meet that makes a difference it's going back to when i wanted to be in the police yeah how somebody can influence you and influence your career because you're getting that connection with somebody outside of school yeah do you think it builds their confidence as oh, well without, too without a doubt we, we so we've committed as a charity to make sure every young person in the Isle of Man gets those five or more contacts throughout their education and what's lovely for me now is we start to get case studies of young people now who've gone through our programs and we can show how that's impacted their career what's your favorite one well there's, there's a combination of them really there's a young lady who um was did the entrepreneurial program and she led her team to victory so they won student company of the year so the benefit of our listeners yes. who haven't got a clue what junior achievement is what that is do you want to just sure, quickly yeah. explain it so we are the island's largest educational charity that goes into schools that helps young people to make the connection between education and the world of work but they put together a project don't they they do well yeah. this particular program we do is the last one which is at year 12 which mm-hmm. is at 16 to 17 year olds 
they get the opportunity to run their own business over the course of an academic year with the support of a volunteer business mentor. We give them no money, no idea, and ask them just to get on with it. <laughs> but do you know what? It's incredible because we, as we get older, we're very cynical and we always say, you can't do this, you can't do that. Some of the ideas they come up with are truly f- phenomenal. I just wish I thought of them. Yeah. Um, but this young lady in particular, um, her team, what they've done is they developed a wristband that they used as an alarm band. Most of us would use them for pedometers or for walking. But one of the problems that we have when alarm clocks go off is the internal reaction in our bodies that you know it causes you to jump up, your heart rate to go faster, wakes up the rest of the house, the dogs, the cats, everything. And they'd come across this problem and this, this wristband vibrates on your arm. So it slowly wakes you up from your sleep and carries on vibrating until you wake up. But it could be used for a myriad of things. Do you manage to take tablets, all kinds of things. They won the Junior Achievement Student Company of the Year competition and then went to Europe to compete in the European finals against 40 other countries. And she'd gone to university for 12 months and realised it wasn't for her. But she'd come into our office and said, you're never going to guess what, I've got a placement with Warner Brothers. So, um, <laughs> and basically she'd gone as an intern to work in their marketing department, looking after for social media, yeah. for some really well-known uh, names, pop stars. And uh, she's been taken on permanently now. So, um, But it was lovely that she, she came in to tell us that she'd been successful. But there's a number of other success stories that we've got on the island, not just off island as well. Yeah, that's, fun. that's fabulous. Yeah, but they'll, they'll say to you, it's this programme that gives them the confidence to to try something else, yeah, even yeah. to become entrepreneurial and maybe think about starting their own business. And those case studies are what are they on their your website? Or? Yes, we've been putting. Yeah. I've been putting quite a lot on LinkedIn and yes, Facebook. Yes, I've noticed that. Yeah. So, and we're not just looking for those that have maybe got top flying careers, but those who actually feel that that JAs had some impact in their career and definitely aided them to to get on the career ladder. So, you know, we've met teachers, somebody's been trained to be an optician. There's there's all different walks yeah, of life really. Yeah, sure. But it's just been lovely to catch up with them. Yeah. yeah. If you don't mind me asking then, and given that you've written this program <laughs> uh, and, and I primarily do ask people this when I meet them in my normal day job role of financial planner, but what's what was your earliest memory of money, Sue? Probably not having any. Yeah. So um my family were in service, my dad was a chauffeur and so um Literally at school, I would have meal vouchers and, and vouchers for clothes. Um, but I came from a very loving family, so that, that didn't matter to me. But for me, um, I wanted to get money for myself. And my grandfather used to work in a sweet factory. And sometimes there would be misshapen sweets that would come off the line. So I would give him a pound to buy a bag and then go to school and make four pound on that bag of sweets. So I was very, I'd sell them at school. That's that's (laughs) very entrepreneurial. Goodness. So that's my earliest memory of making money. Uh, It's it's kind of being driven to try and make money because I didn't come from a very well off family. No, okay. And and you've you've used that, those skills throughout life to... um, Totally. And I was very, very passionate about, particularly about the financial literacy programme. Mm. because I'd experienced some challenging things myself. I once, um, there was a loan agreement, for example, that I hadn't signed and when I eventually did, they put an extra £1,000 on top of it. I've, I've experienced quite a few challenging things throughout my life when it comes to money. And I think if I'd been better educated or understood, and particularly in this day and age when, you know, there wasn't credit cards when I left school, you weren't worried about credit ratings and all the things that went with that. And even at Hamlin, we would see young people get turned down for jobs because they had a poor credit rating but didn't know what a credit rating was. And it might be something as simple as not paying a catalogue bill or missing a payment on an electric bill. But if you go to work for a financial institution, they very often will do a credit rating. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, they had had no clue. So I, I felt we had an obligation to bring young people out of school as financially capable adults so that they could also protect their families as well from things like scams and identity theft and just being more knowledgeable. Yeah, that's pretty much the most inspiring answer anyone's ever given me to that question. <laughs> Great, thank you. And of all the things that you've done throughout your life so far, what, what, what thing has given you the most fulfilment from both a personal and... And a business perspective, I suppose. Uh, uh, personal would be, I climbed the Great Wall of China three years ago um, Golly. on a charity trek. Um, yeah. I was diagnosed with an underactive thyroid three years ago. 
and for those listeners who don't know it, so it means your metabolic rate basically doesn't work and I managed to get over that but felt that I needed a challenge to get back to being fit and I'm, I'm not really somebody who ever attempted anything like this before in my life and signed up to do it and it was life changing oh quite literally life changing because yeah. when you're on that wall thousands of feet up which is man-made suddenly all the little things uh, don't matter and it's taught me not to be as risk averse so you do I do take calculated risks but now I know I can do that I'm yeah. thinking I can I can do other things yeah and from a business perspective it's got to be JA really you know from where we were uh, 2009 to where we are now so for any aspiring or, or existing business owners even what would be your number one business tip i think it's your customers without a doubt uh, i think very often people forget their customers and, and i was there's a I, I wrote it down here because it was something mahatma gandhi said and if i should just say what it was it was a customer is the most important thing in our premises he's not dependent on us we are dependent on him and i think too many people forget their customers you know we've learned that through volunteers at ja yeah absolutely you have to make them your number one wise words and what do you do to relax how do you keep your life in balance other than walking the great wall of china <laughs> well i think walking is the thing really for me yeah. you know ja uh, is a fake uh, it's a vocation it's not a job so it does yes. it does tend to um, also seep into my personal life uh, but no I, I just like to go out go out walking i think the island is a brilliant place for walking yeah what's your favorite walk it has to be marine drive yeah um the scenery there is just incredible it's stunning and and at some points your mobile doesn't work yeah <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. which is your favorite walking out or walking back i do both so usually yeah. what i'll do is i walk from douglas head to port Sodrick right. and back okay. and it's just breathtaking isn't it yeah. you know and the fact that you're closed off a part of the road is e- is even that's, better yeah that's nice no 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 motorists. i just i just really i don't know why i just really like it up there it's very very peaceful yeah very good what do you think then are the best things about living in the isle of man given that you chose to come here all those years ago and it, air quality is one of them okay um, when i lived in warrington we're near witness and run call which are very industrialized yes aren't they just yeah and uh, the first thing i notice when i go back to see my mum is the air quality so the air that we breathe here is really really clear it's lovely it's clear yeah and being a woman isn't it magic that we can go and walk anywhere and feel safe yes you cannot uh, underestimate the value of that being able to go and walk out and, and know that you're okay there aren't many safe. places i know that you can do that yeah no that's uh, so it's, it's safety really and quality yeah. of life yeah. So what would you say then, given how good that is, what's the main challenges that the Isle of Man faces? I think there's, there's quite a lot, really. But one of those that probably people wouldn't expect me to say is, is um, our ageing population and how we are going to accommodate that moving forward. I believe that uh, older people have a lot, lot to give back to the community. Totally just. And I think there's an opportunity to use them within the workforce. Uh, being Q's very good at that. Um, they, they got onto that very, very early on. We are not providing the necessary accommodation f- to build communities. Uh, if you look at American places like that, where they, you know, we tend to put people either in old people's homes or they're in the houses they can no longer afford to keep. They don't know where to move. There's not the right accommodation. Uh, my mum's sister lives in this fabulous uh, facility in Birmingham where they actually have a whole community that has a shop and a swimming pool and a theatre. And uh, especially, I think the pandemic for me has raised that issue because I think a lot of older people have suffered terrible loneliness. They have, yeah. And I just think we've, because communities, families don't live together like they used to do. And I think if it's loneliness, that's me, that's one of the biggest yeah. contributors of mental well-being and, and being ill. And if you yeah. can solve that, then surely there's going to be a saving to the, the health system yes. as well. I very much enjoyed um, interviewing Jackie Brideson from Yeah, she's great, Live Jackie, at home. isn't she? And yeah. that, that that's, seeks to, to serve that very part of the community. But I have found myself thinking uh, another programme coming along called Community Achievement, yeah. <laughs> where, you, <laughs> where you have uh, young people mentoring old people or something, I don't know. I think there has been um, cases, haven't there, where people, young people who can't afford to live in certain accommodation have gone to live with an older person, they shared the accommodation yes. and got to make, make friendships. We, we're too quick to put people in, in old people's homes. People don't necessarily want to do that. My generation is going to want Wi-Fi if we go in a, yeah. in a home, you know. Yes. I just think there's a missed out opportunity here. Yeah. Yeah. And not forgetting that these people might have cash to spend as well. Yeah, community gardens, sort of, yeah. those projects. You, when you go into a, a sheltered housing facility, you give up your garden, don't you? And oh, that would be I don't more. think that's the answer. You know, I think there's, yeah. there's got to be a greater discussion around that. And yeah. I don't think you can get away from it because we're going to live longer. Yeah, yeah, yeah we are. So. 
No, absolutely. Okay, so what, what would you do then? What would be what solutions would you have? I think housing's the main one. I think we're building lots of houses and uh, for families, but I don't think we're thinking about the older community. Oh, I couldn't agree more. Have you read the Thursday Murder Club? No, I've not. No, uh, it's, it's all about a retirement village. Right. And it sounds amazing. <laughs> so, but they they yeah. call it in America. You know, they they yeah. they they they've thought about this, and I, mm. I just think we are not providing housing. And so what we've got are people perhaps staying in their family homes that they are not really suitable no, for them big, for a mobility dangerous. issue yeah. and all those kinds of things because there isn't affordable housing, not sheltered housing where you've got a tiny room, but affordable housing for them to move into, you know, shortage of bungalows. But you see, it's not really when you can build a house and, and charge so much more money for it, then you're not going to you're not going to build bungalows yeah, as developers, are you? No, you know? it's, it's 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 it is a it is it is a, a central government policy decision that needs yes. grasping and something doing with urgently so we know about the 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 junior achievement program for the summer holidays but knowing you i guess you've got something planned beyond that <laughs> well in addition to all the programs that we've got coming up yep. we've got our next charity track in easter next year so oh, wow. um we're doing the latter part of el camino de santiago which is also known as saint james's way it's um, in northern Spain, one of the oldest pilgrimage walks in the world. And we're doing the last 115 kilometres. Yeah. Um, there's a moment, 20 of us going from the Alma. We've got about four places left if anybody fancies joining. <laughs> right, OK. Uh, joining the JA team, but that will be... So um, what's Easter the purpose of that? It's, is it to raise money for JA? It is. It raises yeah. money for JA, um, but it's also great from a personal perspective. You know, if you're looking for a challenge, especially if you're a single traveller as well. Yes. Um, you know, we, we've had a lot of people who've come on our tracks because there's the safety in numbers and the track company we deal with are fabulous. You have a UK doctor that comes with you. We've got guide leaders. It's really very, very well organised and um, yeah, great Sounds, opportunity. Yeah, okay. Well, okay, send me details. Great. We can yeah. put that with the show notes. What, what sort of books do you read or do you watch other... Sort no, of I'm, I'm more of a... Um, because I do so much research for junior achievement, I'm not a great book reader, but I do tend to watch documentaries and, right. and films, you know. So what's your favourite... Well, I, um, one of my most recent films I watched was The Darkest Hour with Gary Oldman, which is about Churchill. Yeah. Um, it, it hit a note with me because my stepfather was at Dunkirk and so were his four brothers and his father. So there was five of them, well, six of them all together. Gosh. And um, all of them came back but one of them my, my father came back on an Isle of Man boat gosh um, so he was do you know one, which one it was I don't know I, 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 for some reason I've got the word Irish Daffodil but I'm not sure that's the one but I know he was he was brought back on one of the boats from the Isle of Man so gosh. his brothers and his father were evacuated from the beaches so when I watched that film it really hit a, a note with me I feel I regret not sitting down with him and talking more about the whole experience that's what the one big before we lost him so that's the one big regret that I had have you know yeah, yeah but incredible for the, the whole family to come back yeah that's that is an amazing story but a brilliant film yeah yeah yes, fantastic I've, I've film, seen it yeah it's, it? It's, it's, it's really good i enjoyed it so what is your um what's your favorite quote sue it's kind of a henry ford or it's a take on a henry ford quote if you think you can you can if you think you can't you can't yeah so i have that's how i have to run my life really you know especially with ja i have to think that i can because if i start to doubt myself oh you can. i just wouldn't do it you know you definitely can <laughs> so where can people go to learn more about you sue there's we've the, the ja has got a, quite a number of resources hasn't it we so, do we've, yeah. we've got our website um yep. but if you were to put junior achievement isle of man into facebook we've got a very busy facebook page fantastic um and we're on instagram yeah for the for the youth <laughs> yeah. and um i'm on linkedin and so is is junior yes. achievement yes. so i think if you put the word junior achievement element to google you'd come up probably with one more one of those those profiles okay well what we'll do is we will put those links into our show notes so people can Brilliant. also look them up there the key thing for us for call out now is mainly for volunteers and just raising awareness of, of our work really because yeah. i think a lot of parents don't realize that when the children bring the books home it's junior achievement that's that's raised them money to run those programs i think often they think the school are delivering them but it's actually our charity yeah thank you it's very okay. much for sharing. and Thanks thank for you so me. much for being a wonderful guest today it's been a real privilege thank you thank you thank you for listening to this episode of island influencers from thornton chartered financial planners to find out more and for useful links visit thorntonfs.com slash podcasts